Hey, shalom everyone. This is Chris Shoemaker, also known as Yehuda Ben Shomer, and welcome to the Monthly Musing. Today we are going to be discussing the gods of the Heavenly Divine Council. Yes, I said gods in the plural. Throws a lot of people off, uh, especially one coming from a monotheistic um, uh, faith and religion, because we as believers in uh, the God of Israel and in Messiah Yeshua, we believe that there is only one God. So uh, what do I mean by the gods of the heavenly divine council? Okay, allow me to elaborate. The Abrahamic faiths of Judaism, Christianity, and even Islam cling to what is known as monotheism, meaning that there is only one God. Deuteronomy 6.4, which I call the John 3.16 of Judaism. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And true, Adonai, God, is the one and only eternal supreme God. However, the Bible is clear that we have been taught to deny it and interpret the scriptures otherwise, that other gods, other Elohim, as it says in the Hebrew, indeed do exist. Elohim is the Hebrew word for God or gods, depending on the context. Deuteronomy 10, 17, for the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords a great God, a mighty and terrible, uh, which regardeth no persons nor taketh reward. Deuteronomy 32, 39, see now that I, even I am he, and there is no God with me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. Neither is there any that can deliver out of my hand. Not only does the word Elohim refer to gods, but angelic beings, idols, departed human spirits, and demons. Uh, and this is found through so many passages I don't even want to begin to cite because I'd be listing them for about a minute or two. But uh, what if passages like Deuteronomy 4.35 and 39, Deuteronomy 6.4, and Deuteronomy 32.12 and 39? So, unto thee <clears throat> it was showed that thou mightest know that the Lord, he is God. There is none else beside him. Know therefore this day and consider in thine heart that the Lord, he is God in heaven above and upon the earth beneath. There is none else. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. So the Lord alone did lead him, and there is no strange God with him. See now that I, even I am he, and there is no God with me. So does this show that Adonai is the uh, one and only God and that other gods simply don't exist? Is that what these passages are saying and alluding to? Indeed, this is what I've been taught and raised to believe, that you know all the other gods are false gods and they're just idols and they're not real and they don't exist. They're fairy tale and make-believe. Uh, no. All that these passages do is state that Adonai God is incomparable. There is no other God like or above him. These passages speak of the sovereignty and supremacy of Adonai God and not the exclusivity of his existence. Such statements, uh, such statement of um, incomparability is found elsewhere in Scripture referring uh, in uh, referencing humanity. Isaiah 47, 8, Therefore hear now this, that thou art given to pleasure that dwellest carelessly, that saith in thine heart, I am, and none else beside me. I shall not sit as a widow, neither shall I know the loss of children. Here Babylon is boasting, I am, and none else beside me. Does this mean that Babylon is the only people or kingdom on earth? Of course not. It's simply a boast of Babylon's supremacy over other peoples and kingdoms. Assyria boasts the same in Zephaniah 2.15. This is the rejoicing city that dwell carelessly, that said in her heart, I am, and there is none beside me. How is she become a desolation, a place for beasts to lie down in? Everyone that passes by her shall hiss and wag his hand. Again, this speaks of supremacy and not exclusivity. Elohim is finally used in connection with other heavenly divine created beings in Psalm 82 that some would call angels or messengers, but the scriptures uh, themselves would call gods, lowercase g. Psalm 82, God, meaning Adonai, standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judgeth among the gods, plural, lowercase g. How long will ye judge unjustly? 
and accept the persons of, of the wicked, Selah. Defend the poor and fatherless, do justice to the afflicted and needy, deliver the poor and needy, rid them out of the hand of the wicked. They know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness, and all the foundations of the earth are out of course. I have said, this is God speaking, I have said, ye are gods. And all of you are children of the Most High. So basically, these lowercase g-o-d, lowercase gods, are also referred to as the sons of God. They are div heavenly divine created beings that are called in the Hebrew Elohim, which again, may I remind you, is re in reference to, to Adonai God, to false gods, to angels, to demons, to human judges, departed human spirits, depending on the context is, 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 is defines the definition of Elohim. Verse 7, but ye shall die like men and fall one like princes. Talking how these divinely created beings who are called Elohim uh, are finite. They are not eternal like Adonai. Verse 8, arise, O God, and judge the earth. Thou shalt inherit all nations. But we see evidence of other heavenly beings besides angels. We see beasts or living creatures with multiple faces in Ezekiel 1 and Revelation 4. And so in Psalm 82 and other passages uh, I will cite, we see created heavenly beings as part of, of Adonai God's divine counsel. So what does this say about the Christian and Jewish view of monotheism? Nothing, really. We still believe Adonai is the one and only supreme deity, uncreated and eternal. The other quote-unquote gods are lesser, finite, created beings with what we would consider godlike powers and abilities, especially compared to us mortals. Some have called this type of uh, monotheism biblical theism. Some would ask how one can be monotheistic and yet believe Adonai God is, is three yet one. Concerning what most Christianity uh, refers to as the quote-unquote trinity, I refer to it as a triunity. I believe that God reveals himself in many ways, characteristics, and sephirot, including but not limited to Abba, the Father, the Word, or the Ben, the Son, and the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. And I believe that these three emanations from God are co-eternal, co-equal, and coexisting in one echad, one in unity, one in plurality, and one divine essence. Uh, H.com, Kabbalah Series 3 of 24 says, God's unity vis-a-vis uh, -vis the ten sephirot may be likened to a ray of sun passing through a prism. On one side, we have a single ray of light, while on the other side, we perceive a radiation of seven colors. The person sitting on the other side perceives this as if they were many lamps radiating many hues, while in reality, it's one lamp. The multi-hued rainbow is a distortion created by the prism that light has passed through. The Sephardic tree consists of many charts and formulas and lists uh, many of God's attributes, so I'll not get into that. This is not the purpose of this work. However, I will say that there is a concept referred to as the three pillars, which consist of Bina, uh, understanding, Keter, crown or one's will, and Chokhmah, uh, wisdom. The sages refer to them as Bina as the father, Hochma as the mother, uh, and Keter as the son. And this in turn would coincide with the concept of the triunity of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's interesting to note that the word Holy Spirit in the Hebrew is feminine, which would lend credence to the three pillars of the Sephardic tree, the Bina being the mother. In, in another place of Kabbalistic literature, uh, there are references to lesser uh, Yahweh, lesser uh, you know, lesser Elohim, which describe Yeshua uncannily. Now, I'm not saying that God is male and female, and I'm not saying that God is uh, father, mother, and and son. I'm saying that this is this is figurative speech to to describe the Godhead, the unity of the Godhead. And if God creating mankind, male and female, God is a spirit. He has no gender, no sex. So God is a spirit, but within God are masculine and feminine attributes, and he gave them to mankind in the form of man and woman. You know, so if, if there's man, if there's masculinity and femininity, God created that. It must be contained within God himself for him to be able to create that. So as far as Messiah goes, I believe that Yeshua the Messiah of the branch is the prophesied Messiah of Israel. He is fully God to be able to redeem us 
from our sins and fully man to have the right to redeem us from our sins, to be our kinsman redeemer, according to Ruth, Jeremiah 17, 5 through 7 and John 1. Yeshua is the perfect, holy, sinless Messiah, the figurative Son of God, who is the Word that became flesh and dwelt among us, John 1.14, who came to dwell in a mortal body that never saw corruption, Psalm 14.10, a pure deity manifest in the flesh. He was not an incarnation, which would denote that 100% of God came in the flesh. Yeshua was fully God in the flesh, but not 100% God. Adonai is, is um, I, I probably should, should flesh that out a little bit more. Yeshua was fully God in the flesh, but not 100% God. So in other words, Yeshua was 100% divine, but not 100% of the divinity itself was in, was in Yeshua. So let me describe it to you this way. Adonai is so infinite that he is everywhere and fills everything. So it would be impossible for all of God to be limited to a mortal body. In the words of Dr. Friedman, if we were to go to the Mediterranean Sea and fill a glass with seawater, we can say that all the water in the glass is truly seawater. However, we cannot call the glass the Mediterranean Sea. So there is much more to the Mediterranean Sea than the glass. Yet nonetheless, the water in the glass is truly Mediterranean seawater through and through. So the body of Yeshua was just like the glass. And the divinity within Yeshua was like the Mediterranean seawater. 100% Mediterranean seawater, 100% God but not all of who God is, not all of God. So the triunity of the Godhead is not the same as the heretical views of tritheism or modalism. Uh, Baruch Zion, issue 71, page 29 says, it is entirely tolerable to the Hebraic mind to accept a paradox. To the non-Hebraic mind, the paradox is seen as a blatant contradiction and is summarily dismissed as nonsense. Though all object lessons attempting to describe the triunity of the Godhead is, uh, is an understandable way, um, has flaws and falls short, the best example in my opinion without getting too nitpicky or splitting hairs is the example of H2O. H2O can exist simultaneously in three states, a gas, a solid, and a liquid, in the guise of steam melt and a melting ice cube. You have the gaseous vapor coming off the solid ice cube with melting water underneath, all existing at the same place in the same time and yet be one, H2O. It's H2O. Similarly, God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three separate and distinct beings, yet co-eternal, uh, co-equal, and co-existing in one divine essence. All of them are Adonai. Back to the matter at hand, uh, that of the divine counsel of the gods. Deuteronomy 32, 8 through 9 in the English Standard Version says, And when the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, they divided mankind, and he fixed borders of the people according to their number, and the sons of God. But the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob, his allotted heritage. You will find other translations such as King James translated from the manuscripts that are not as old as the ones in the English Standard. Uh, it says, sons of Israel. But such a translation in context of the passage makes absolutely no sense. The sons of God, this refers to angels and or divine council members. You see, originally, God had a divine council. He obviously didn't need such a council, but consulted them before he was about to do anything. It would be like a parent consulting a child regarding what they would do on their summer vacation to, a, uh, uh, to go to a theme park. The parent likely uh, has it all planned out but just wants the kid's opinion and thoughts on the matter. Or as a boss who knows what he's about to do, but gathers his employees to hear how they feel on the matter or what their consensus is. So the divine council jubilantly voiced their approval at creation. Job 38, 4 through 7. Where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Who hast laid the measure thereof, if thou knowest, or hast stretched upon it uh, uh, the line upon it? Whereupon the foundations therefore uh, fastened, or who has laid the corner thereof? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Morning stars, another idiom for heavenly and or angelic beings. Sons of God, again, uh, referring to the divine council or angelic heavenly created beings. Isaiah 14, 12, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? Isaiah 14, 12. Satan, 
Lucifer, or known in Hebrew as Hillel, is called Son of the Morning, referring to the planet Venus, which looks like a star and is the first quote-unquote star seen when the sun comes up in the morning. Also, Venus is sometimes referred to as Hell because it's close proximity to the sun and its greenhouse cloud cover, uh, which traps hellish, unbearable temperatures in it. Job 38.7, when the morning stars sang together, all the sons of God, of God shouted for joy. Here again, stars and heavenly slash angelic beings are referenced. Revelation 22.16, I, Yeshua, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root of the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. Yeshua, being from heaven, and God in bodily form, like angels who took on bodily form, is referenced here as a star. Not only the fallen angels take on bodily human form, but the unfallen angels as well. As we see the two angels that visited Lot, um, and as Hebrews 13.2 tells us, that we entertain angels sometimes and do not realize it. Again, Deuteronomy 32, 8 through 9, when the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind, he fixed the borders of the peoples according to their number of the sons of God. But the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob, his allotted heritage. Deuteronomy 32, 8 through 9 refers to the peoples of the earth uh, being divided up among their language groups after the incident of the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11. And all the nations were divided up among the divine council members to oversee and report back to Adonai uh, in that Israel, uh, Adonai himself would oversee. So basically, God chose Israel as his inheritance. He gave uh, the uh, root, 70 root nations to 70 of the divine council members to manage and report back to him. But what happened was the divine council members rebelled against Adonai and made themselves out to be gods of the nations that they had been given responsibility over. They made themselves out to be sun and moon deities, gods of sex and war, etc. Deuteronomy 4.19 says, Unless thou lift up thine eyes into heaven, and when thou seest the sun and the moon and the stars, and even all the host of heaven, talking about the angels and the divine council members, should be driven to worship them and serve them, which the Lord thy God has divided unto all nations under the, under the heavens. Psalm 89, 5 through 6. And the heavens shall praise thy wonders, O Lord, thy faithfulness also to the congregation of the saints. For who in the heavens can be compared unto the Lord? Who among the sons of the mighty, talking about the sons of God, the divine council members, the angels, can be likened unto the Lord? Daniel 10, 10 through 18, speaks of these fallen divine Elohim, gods, as princes over particular peoples and nations, reinforcing the division of nations among the divine council members, as in Deuteronomy 32, 8 through 9. The book of Jubilees uh, is, is, is uh, extra biblical literature, which basically says the same thing. In Jubilees 15, 31 through 32 says, And he sanctified it and gathered it from amongst all the children of men. For there are many nations and many peoples, and all are his. And over all hath he placed spirits and authority to lead them astray from him. But over Israel he did not appoint any angel or spirit, for he alone is their ruler. And he will preserve them and require them at the hand of his angels and his spirits, and at the hand of his powers, in order that he may preserve them and bless them, and they may be his, and he may be theirs from henceforth and forever. The following are but examples in other parts of Scripture regarding divine counsel and their uh, sessions with Adonai God. So you see Job chapters uh, 1 and 2 uh, talking about uh, the sons of God coming before uh, God to be inspected, to be interviewed, and who was among them but... Lucifer, Hillel, Satan himself, and he was asked, what are you doing? Oh, I've been to and, throw, to and fro about the earth. Uh, so we also see another example, another example in uh, 1 Kings, uh, chapter 22, verses 19 through 22. And he said, hear thou therefore the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven standing by him, a.k.a. angels and divine council members. And on his right hand and on his left, and the Lord said, Who shall persuade Ahab that he may go up and fall at Ramoth-Gilead? 
So he he is asking his angels or his divine council members, who's who's gonna who's gonna thwart Ahab's plan and and uh, counsel him uh, so that it'll fail. One said on this manner, and another said on that manner. So several of the divine council members had their own opinion. And there came forth a spirit and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. And the Lord said unto him, wherewith? And he said, I will go forth and be a lying spirit in the mouth of, of all his prophets. And he said, thou shalt persuade him and prevail also. Go forth and do so. Jeremiah 2, 18. For who hath stood in the counsel of the Lord? Who hath perceived and heard his words? Who hath marked his word and heard it? Counsel of the Lord. Talking about his divine council members, his angels, and you know, divine heavenly beings that are there. So, these fallen divine council members not only ruled over the nations as false gods, but physically manifested themselves in bodily form and produced offspring with human women. Here is our first encounter with these offspring and fallen heavenly divine beings, the, the, the giants. In Genesis 6, 1 through 4, and it came to pass uh, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wise of all that they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, and his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. They were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God, sons of God in the Old Testament is always referring to angels or divine council members. When the sons of God came unto the daughters of men, in other words, they cohabitated, copulated with them, and they bare children unto them. The same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. The word giants or Nephilim in the Hebrew carries a double meaning. It means giants, but it also means fallen ones. Most Christians in this quote-unquote enlightened age of today scoff at even the suggestion that fallen angels could possibly have cohabitated with women. Yet this was the original meaning and intent of this very passage. Only in the modern centuries have man tried to explain this away as the wicked daughters of Cain seducing and marrying the righteous sons of Seth. Boulder Dash. Every instance in the Old Testament where the phrase sons of God is used, it is used in direct reference to the angelic race and is obviously and it is obvious that the daughters of men were mortal women. Indeed, this is one of the reasons why God deemed the worldwide flood necessary, not because of the wicked, sinful, rebellious ways uh, of mankind, not only this, but because the fallen angels were impregnating human women in an effort to thwart the prophecy of Messiah coming. Genesis 3.15, also known as the Proto-Evangelium, says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman. Who's thee? The thee uh, in this uh, passage is Satan and his fallen angelic hosts. I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed. In other words, he's saying that these fallen angels has the ability to procreate. I don't understand it. I can't explain it, but that's what it means. And between thy seed and her seed, her seed, talking about the, the, the divinity, the divine uh, virgin birth of Messiah, because a woman doesn't have a seed. They have an egg. The sperm is the seed. Seed comes from the father. And it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. This fact is backed up again and again in Midrashic, Talmudic, Kabbalistic, and Rabbinical literature. Deuteronomy one twenty eight. Whither shall we go up? Our brethren have discouraged our hearts, saying, The people is greater and taller than we. The cities are great and walled up to heaven, and moreover, we have seen the sons of Anakim there. The descendants, who are the sons of Anakim? The descendants of Semchazi and Azel, who fell from heaven in the generation of Enosh, according to Rashi. This Hasidic master explained that the generations of the spies was loath to enter the land because they feared the trans transition from the spiritual life they led in the desert where they were sustained by the bread of heaven and all their physical needs were provided by miraculous means, uh, means, and their sole occupation was to study the Torah in service to God, to a life on land and all material entanglements that it brings. This explains the spies' uh, mention of the sons of the giants they, they encountered in the land. The Midrashic, uh, in the Midrash, Yalchut Shimonai, Bereshit 44, relates the story of these fallen angels. In the years before the flood, when the violence and promiscuity pervaded the earth, two angels, Samchazi and Azael, 
uh, pleaded before the Almighty, Allow us to dwell among humans, and we shall sanctify your name. But no sooner had the two heavenly beings come into contact with the material world, they too were corrupted. If these heavenly beings, uh, the spies were saying, could not survive the plunge into mater materiality, what could be expected of, of us, mortal and fragile men? This according to the Lubavitcher Rebbe. The extra-biblical books such as Enoch, Jasher, Jubilees, and others, which is what much of the Talmudic and rabbinic writings are based on, are full of accounts likening the fallen heavenly beings and or angels uh, cohabitating with human women as one of the main reasons for the global noatic flood. Uh, you could also see Syriac 16, 7 through 8, 3 Maccabees 2, 4 through 5, and the Testament of Naphtali 3, 4 through 5, and Jubilees 20, 4 through 5, and 1 Enoch 1, 9. Jubilees 5, 1 through 4 says, And it came to pass, when the children of men began to multiply in the face of the earth, that daughters were born unto them, and the angels of God saw them, on a certain year of the Jew, of this jubilee, that they were beautiful to look upon, and they took them wives, all whom they chose, and they bare unto them sons that were giants, and lawlessness increased on the earth, and all flesh corrupted its ways. So genetically it corrupted its ways, where they were no longer purely genetically human. Alike men and cattle and beasts and, and birds and everything that walks on the earth uh, corrupted their ways and their order. And they begin to devour each other, and lawlessness increased on the earth, and every imagination of the thoughts of men were thus evil continually. So not only were there these angelic human hybrids, but the animals were also becoming hybridized. And these chimera uh, creatures, you know, lions with wings and whatever, uh, were, were created. And this is what has, has produced the myth uh, that we see predominantly in Greek mythology such as the Cenotar and the Minotaur, you know, half horse, half man, half man, half bull kind of thing. So it continues on, and God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. It was perverted. All flesh had corrupted its orders. In other words, it left its created order and became its own thing. And all that were upon the earth had wrought all manner of evil before his eyes, and he said, I shall destroy man and all flesh upon the face of the earth which I have created. If Satan through his fallen angels could pollute human seed, then there would be no pure untainted human seed for the Messiah to come through, thus another reason for the flood of Noah and his family being spared. This is where the legend of the giants and mytholo mythological type beings came from that Greece and Rome are so famously uh, for speaking of. The first of these giants became king, uh, kingly rulers over mankind, and they were called Rephaim. Uh, which Og, king of Bashan, was the last, according to Deuteronomy 3.11 and Joshua 12.4. Uh, for further details on all this regarding giants and Nephilim, please consult my monthly musing uh, for December 2018 called Giants. So continuing on, uh, you know, after the flood, uh, you know, the, the giants were wiped out, the, the human angelic hybrid beings were wiped out, but they kept doing this again. Um, so, you know, Goliath and his brothers were part of this, uh, the, the, the Nephilim. Um, you know, Og, king of Bashan, was one of these. So the giants continued even after the flood. Part of their physical description not only was the great height, you know, seven, nine feet, twelve feet tall. But uh, the the they also had six fingers and 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 six toes on each appendage. We even encounter passages in the New Testament regarding the fallen angels and their Nephilim offspring. Matthew twenty two twenty nine through thirty says, Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err, not knowing the Scripture nor power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of the God in heaven. This passage speaks of heavenly, obedient, unfallen angels that they don't marry. It doesn't say that they cannot or do not have the ability to have sexual intercourse and to reproduce. And such angels uh, who rebelled against God and cohabitated with women, uh, Jude 1, 6-7 has this to say about it. And the angels which kept not their first estate, their unmarried estate, they're cohabitating with women, that they kept away from that. The angels which, which kept not from their first estate, but left their own habitation, heaven, came to earth, 
He hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness until judgment of the great day, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh. So it's very possible that the Sodomites that were knocking on Lot's door knew that his guests were angels because it says that they were seeking after strange flesh. So they were in the habit of, of, of copulating and, 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 and cohabitating with fallen, divine, heavenly beings, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh and set forth an example, suffer the vengeance of eternal fire. So I believe the activity of these fallen heavenly beings and their Nephilim have not ceased, but uh, is the modern explanation for the UFO and alien phenomena that we see today. Think about it. It's the same old plan, but a different, more modern package for our space age. Human women are abducted. They are impregnated and then reabducted to extract the hybrid child, and many, and many of them are shown their prodigy. Uh, this is no, uh, there is no proof that these aliens come from another planet, but there's plenty of evidence leaning towards that they come from another dimension. Plus, if these quote-unquote aliens give a message for mankind, it's usually, usually a New Age humanistic message that belittles Messiah and his word and puts him on the level of other religious world leaders, such as Muhammad and Buddha. Also, the same paranormal activity that takes place during a poltergeist of demonic activity is the same type of activity that happens in the presence of these aliens and their spacecraft. This sounds like Nephilim to me. So when Israel was afraid of these giants, I don't think they were just in intimidated by their height, uh, because I think strategically they were probably more agile and faster uh, and probably can maneuver quite well. I think they were more fearful of their possible spiritual capabilities being uh, half human, half fallen angel, and they were afraid of their powers. Uh, so that's why I think that the children of Israel were afraid to take the land of Canaan, uh, not because of the height of the, of the giants, but they, they didn't know what kind of powers they possessed, right? So uh, in Matthew chapter 17 of the Mount of Transfiguration, uh, we see that uh, uh, Yeshua was on this mount, which was Mount Hermon, by the way, which, according to paganism, was the mountain that capped uh, the entrance to the underworld. And it was also, according to the apocryphal, pseudepigraphal literature of extra-biblical literature, that Mount Hermon was the place where the fallen angels descended to and set up their Mount Olympus of sorts. So we see Yeshua here being transfigured and becoming shiny, and he was also there with Moses and Elijah. So you may be wondering what this passage has to do with the divine council members, the fallen angels and Nephilim. Well, the Mount of Transfiguration is Mount Hermon, uh, the mount where the fallen angels, uh, the fallen heavenly beings decided to band together and rebel against God and turn the nations away from him. It was all con also considered, as I just said before, the gateway to Sheol, to hell, the grave, the underworld. These fallen beings were sometimes called shining ones and noticed that Yeshua changed his appearance into a shining one. Matthew 17 declares God uh, de declares God calling Yeshua his son, implying Yeshua's obedience and thus denouncing the rebellious, angelic sons of God. Yeshua was basically putting the fallen divine council members on notice that they didn't that, that, that they didn't thwart the prophetic coming of the redemption of mankind through himself, through the Messiah, that the protoevangelium of Genesis 3:15 was fulfilled in himself in Messiah Yeshua, and that as Adonai God in the flesh, Yeshua was challenging their rule and announced to his plan to take back the nations uh, from them as well as taking away the power of hell and the grave from them as well. So in the beginning, as we read in earlier passages in Deuteronomy, that the 70 root nations were divided among the council, divine council members who fell and rebelled and became the false gods of these nations and led them away and corrupted them. Uh, here, Yeshua is making a declaration. You think you're a shining one? I'm the shining one. You think you're a son of God? I am the son of God. You think that you have inherited and will rule and have dominion over these nations? Nuh uh. Israel's mine, but I'm taking back the 70 nations as well. So, uh, thank you so much for listening to this monthly musing. I hope that uh, this issue of the gods of the, of the Heavenly Divine Council was very uh, enlightening to you, and I hope I was able to present it in a very understandable way. I know it goes against the uh, mainstream thought and teachings of modern-day Christianity and um, 
you know, what is taught in Bible colleges and at church. But uh, for more information on this, on God's divine counsel, I highly recommend you get two books, The Unseen Realm and Angels, both by Dr. Michael Heiser. Uh, Google Dr. Michael Heiser. He has several websites, and he has one called The Naked Bible Podcast, which he elaborates better than I can about God's heavenly divine counsel. He also has some great videos on YouTube that explains this a lot better than I could. But thanks so much for listening. Go out there and have a great day. Shalom and Shavuot Tov. Abrahamsdescendants.com, getting back to the first century in a 21st century way. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to press the like button as well as the subscribe button if you haven't done so already and the notification bell that'll let you know every time I make a new video. And don't forget to share this with a friend. Also, visit our website at abrahamsdescendants.com. Thanks. Shalom. Thanks for watching. Stay connected by subscribing to our other social media accounts and visiting our website at abrahamsdescendants.com.